All right. So it is another Thursday. I am here with Brian, as well as with my dear friend, Sarah Choi, who is in Manhattan. Hello, Sarah. How are you? Hi, I'm great. It's so great to be connected here with all of you guys, Brian in Miami and you in Mexico. And I love, this is the amazing thing about COVID is it brings people all across the world and the United States together. So it's an honor to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. This is great. I should, I should say though, I'm in Fort Lauderdale. We sort of, um, we like being in Fort Lauderdale. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's both of you are in places warmer than New York City right now. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've lived there, uh, Sarah. So uh, I know New York City in the wintertime. Nevertheless, oh, yeah. it's the most amazing place in the world to live. So yeah, well, I appreciate it. And you know, it's funny, we're talking on a full moon. It's like considered the wolf moon and Leo. And um, it's also called the center moon by uh, a Native American tribe. And the reason why they call it the center moon is because it marks the halfway point of the winter season. So um, I actually like this time in New York City because it allows me to go inward. Whereas a lot of times when I'm in sunny areas, I kind of go outward but mm -hmm. um, during this time i'm able to reflect and go inward so it's a good thing <laughs> what do you find what do you what, i'm sorry what are you finding now when you're going inward what what what's happening for you as you look inside well i think uh collectively we're all kind of invited and forced to go inward ever since uh, January of 2020, right? Where um, we're quarantined and I'm sure people have talked about this to no end, but it is an opportunity for us to put distractions aside. We have so many distractions, whether it's jobs or entertainment or things like that. But with quarantining, it, it makes you kind of set those things aside, set those social obligations aside and makes you reflect like, who am I really? Who am I without these other things, without certain jobs that we depend on or roles that uh, quote unquote define us. And for me personally, it's allowed me to slow down in some ways, but also reflect, well, what is really a priority in my life? Am I just, filling up my schedule with busy things and tasks and obligations and does it make me happy does it bring me joy is it fulfilling my calling that life is calling me to or am I just going through the motions of my life and so the winter really allows me to reflect because we can't socialize right now you know mm -hmm. even a lot of outside uh dining and things like that it's not really possible um so it, it, it gives me more quality time with my partner. We live together. Um, mm -hmm. It allows us to really dig into the intimate questions of life mm -hmm. and what um, makes us feel vulnerable, what makes us feel, feel seen and heard. And I think this is what I'm hearing from a lot of people who mm -hmm. are living with roommates or partners where you can't get these like social times away really. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're faced with these uh, shadow aspects of your personality and your quirks, and um, they're, they come to light in front of the most intimate people that are involved in your, your circle. Mm -hmm. And it allows you to really see yourself uh, through the mirror of other relationships. And mm -hmm. it's, be it's beautiful, it's uh, messy, it's scary, uh, but ultimately, you get this like sweetness in the relationship that mm -hmm. are the true jewels of intimacy. And um, firstly, intimacy with yourself is really mm -hmm. getting to know, your, know yourself. Mm -hmm. And and your boundaries, right? I mean, definitely. Learn, yeah, yeah. If you if you've been able to set them. Yes, yeah. definitely. Well, I'm really good about setting boundaries. I think that my challenge is. Um, 
when other people retreat, I have a tendency to press in mm -hmm. and I have to set a boundary for myself mm -hmm. to like let people have their own boundaries um, and not press. You know, I'm an ER nurse. I've been an ER nurse for 16 years. So we're used to pressing in, going into those like shadowy traumatic spaces. Um, I'm also a holistic nurse and a wellness coach. So we go in for those deeper issues and um, when a lot of times people haven't done that type of trauma mm -hmm. work, if I'm pressing in and they're not ready for it, um, whether it's at work at the bedside as a holistic nurse or an ER nurse or um, in my relationships, in my friendships, in my family, uh, I have to respect that boundary, mm -hmm. um, but also be a catalyst for introspection. So. Mm -hmm. It's a very fine line because I it think it's part of sort of that healer mentality too, which I think is going through a huge shift. So many of us have that sort of healer core to ourselves where we just want to help and we just want to make sure that we're helping as many people as possible. But the mentality has been healing people at the expense of our own selves, mm -hmm. but also blowing through other people's boundaries. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things that I have seen over the last two, three years is that shift into a different definition of a healer. Mm -hmm. I think it's yeah. Oh. I think it's a matter of discernment. You know, as uh, all of us, I think, um, who are out to help other people see ourselves as instruments of the universe. We don't see it as ourselves doing the work. We see ourselves being the instruments. And I think sometimes the ego is what prompts us to think that we can push further uh, than maybe our instincts are telling us to do. Because, mm -hmm. hey, you know, we've got wisdom, you know, we know what we're doing, you should trust us. And, uh, and age helps uh, experience definitely of saying, wait, you know, just be quiet for a second, see how they're doing, check in to see if this is overwhelming. Um, I was actually in a counseling situation with somebody this week who's partner and and his entire family just do not do feelings i mean you don't ask them how you're feeling it, mm. it, it creates panic and uh so how does somebody who comes from a very feeling family you know uh italian in this instance <laughs> uh how does that person uh create uh, a mechanism that works with a partner who you know does not is not comfortable talking about their feeling yeah it's, it's a interesting I, I think it's interesting to think about how how you were raised as a child really plays into mm -hmm. how you relate to people as an adult and that is part of healing is recognizing what are the patterns that you're used to as a child what did you grow up around did you grow up around a, a parent who was present or did they retreat were they absent um, were mm -hmm. they in and out where it wasn't consistent? Um, what were the family dynamics? And that has so much to do with how we relate to people nowadays, whether it's at work or in intimate relationships, friendships, our own nuclear families. I think a lot of times when we aren't able to recognize those patterns, we bring it into our current relationships and it can cause a lot of drama, unnecessary yeah. drama, or maybe it is necessary to bring about that, um, you know, that fire that elicits this change, you know, and I think that is the thing that is the work. I, this is what I talked about one time in my Instagram post is I, I posted something just very real you know I don't hide from my shadows I learn their names you know mm -hmm. I grew I grew up in a Christian family like um, both of my parents are Pentecostal pastors mm -hmm. my sister is also a worship leader her husband's a pastor and I think we grew up keeping everything tight like well, we don't share our problems we have to be perfect we have to be the example and I got tired of it by the time I was 18 I was tired of being quote unquote quote perfect I wanted to be me and I think that was challenging because the way that life was teaching me and showing me different perspectives it, it was definitely in conflict with the way, way I was raised and how my family believes. And so I'm able to uh, recognize that now. And 
We love Brooks Brian there. Okay. Carry on. I'm, Carry on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, I got a, a stupid Apple request, you know, can they say where I am? And then I had to put in a code and it used to be easier when it wasn't so sophisticated. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what, what interests me, Sarah, at least in uh, knowing a little bit about Haley, is that the three of us came to the point where we didn't um, want to abide by the rules any longer. And mm -hmm. I think that's the beginning of the hero's journey, is Definitely. that you, 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 you break from the comfortable uh, or what one would assume is comfortable because there's privilege attached to it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you uh, either roar or you, you at least squeak that, you know, change is in the wind. And, um, and that if, and, and reflecting on what you said, if you spend time thinking about your family of origin, uh, it allows you to decide not to continue the pattern. You know, that's the right. worst thing Ray and I can say to one another is, well, that's your mother speaking. <laughs> Don't bring my mother into this. <laughs> None of us want to be compared to our parents in terms of behavior. Um, and, and, but if, uh, if I know that my mother was a peace at any price person, then I can see, okay, uh, are you in that pattern or are you willing to risk you know, acrimony or upset in order to deal with this issue? Definitely. And I think uh, to add to that is when we don't recognize those patterns and work through that and heal that trauma or that incongruency that we have personally, as opposed to how we were raised in our family, what happens is we kind of take on that role of being the perpetrator mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. we've kind of learned from our parents or we attract those types of patterns mm -hmm. within relationships, whether it's at work, where, you know, we lack boundaries, or we allow other people put, to put push our boundaries, or in relationships where it's the dismissive person, or the person who's not consistent, or someone who's not uh, affirming, or things like that. And then what ends up happening is we end up trying to heal our trauma within mm -hmm. relationships. Mm -hmm. And this is why I think it's so important as uh, quote unquote healers or facilitators of healing to do the work. It's not easy. It's mm -hmm. not pretty. It's actually really messy, um, yeah. but it's so important and mm -hmm. it just helps make the relationships so much more peaceable and less about us working out our own issues in relationships and us doing the inner work and then bringing our full selves into healthy relationships. I was um, listening to Dr. David Hawkins uh, last night, and he's a very interesting character for me. Um, he comes in and out of my life. Sometimes I, it's his books that are so profound. And right now, he, there's some videos of him on YouTube. And he um, was speaking about that you cannot be a teacher unless you've experienced it. And I, you know, that's been one of my sort of little niggling points throughout my hero's journey is that there are people out there trying to teach without experiencing it, trying to go out there and say, this is what spiritualism is, or this is what the hero's journey is. And I'm just, I sit back and I'm like, why are people listening to you, but they're not looking at me? <laughs> right. Well, then learning to let go of the desire to um, have them listen to you as part of the journey too. <laughs> And part of what the person out there that you're describing is teaching is form rather than content. So yeah. they're teaching people and, and sometimes effectively how to meditate, how to sit, right? But mm -hmm. uh, doing the, the hard work, uh, that's why I, you know, I keep going back and I'm, one of the things I love about life is seeing truths keep coming up over and over again in literature, movies, whatever, that um, Herman Hesse's book, Siddhartha, and we've mm -hmm. talked about this, Haley, that, you know, in that book, uh, Siddhartha meets the Buddha, uh, or the Holy One in the book, and his best friend decides to follow the Holy One, but Siddhartha says, no, because what you can't teach me is the experience of learning the truth, and I have to go experience it myself, or I'll never own it. 
And uh, I think that's what you were referring to is that you, you know, we are, we are our most trustworthy and wisest when we speak from uh, the experience of, of doing the hard knocks, you know, of learning. Well, and I think that's how we get in touch with our wisdom. You know, I am a firm believer that we all have the wisdom of the cosmos within us. And it is mm -hmm. the hero's journey to connect with that and to then speak from that place of truth. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in order to get quiet with that, that does require going into these soul searching moments where you unravel all of the torture, you sit in it and you sit in the trauma to be able to say, right, what is the truth here? Mm -hmm. And you can take go of it. And I think it's so important to highlight that if you are going to be the one in your family that decides that you're going to break the rules by stopping the patterns, you absolutely have the power to do that. That mm -hmm. in your decision to recognize a pattern and end the pattern, you heal that entire lineage of that pattern and it stops right there with you. That's right. Um, so, you know, this concept of the hero's journey being so difficult and, you know, why do it? Why go from a place of comfort and a place of ease, albeit in the rules, to completely unravel and go through the hard stuff? And for me, it's that sweetness of I'm ending a pattern. I'm honoring myself. I'm honoring my entire lineage by ending mm -hmm. this pattern. Yeah. And mm -hmm. if I'm the one to do it. I'm the one to do it. Definitely. And I, and I think also it's the journey. It's not like the destination. If we think about the Greek mm -hmm. mythology story of Chiron, the wounded healer, and he was about his happy life as a centaur and he wrestled with a god. Uh, the god hurt his leg, his hip, and um, he spent his entire time trying to come up with remedies to cure himself. But it was that experience of him trying to heal his own wounds that people visited him in the mountains and asked, can you help me as I heal my wounds? And so it's not that his, his wound ever truly healed. It was always a day-to-day -day process of trying to heal his own wounds. But within that experience, he was able to share his testimony with other people and be a blessing to them and 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 it connects with the cosmos right if you look up to the sky he's one of the constellations and um that's the same with us we all have our own stories i think that's ultimately what led me to be a holistic nurse and a wellness coach was I suffered from moral injury as an emergency room nurse and I felt so disconnected from my true self. You know, when I first thought about becoming a nurse, it was about caring for people and holding space for people. But when you work for a system that's so broken down and it doesn't support you to meet those goals of actually promoting wellness and it, it's more about, um, pushing their agenda and with less resources, what ends up happening is you, there becomes a moral injury. And so I, I sought counseling. And within that, she asked me a very pointed question. She asked, well, how can you show compassion to other people you're not living compassionately towards yourself? Yeah. And that really struck me. I, I asked myself, well, what does living compassionately towards myself truly look like on a day-to-day -day basis. And that set me on this healing journey where I had to unlearn all the scripts that I learned from healthcare systems and say like, what is true wellness? What is true healing? Um, healing is not necessarily just seeking a cure. Healing is about mind, body, and spirit connection and learning that well-being and so through that, I found these self-healing modalities and I learned these things and I wanted to share them with other people. And hence, I'm here as a holistic nurse. <laughs> and, and you um, really encourage people to tell their story. Am I correct? Yes, I do. And tell it authentically. I think a lot of times there's this facade of like, oh, you know, I, I, I really like what... Um, Dahlia Mogahid said in her, in what she said about 
toxic spirituality or this new age spirituality where it's uh, all the, you know, nice fluffiness of just sitting on your cushion and being by the beach, which is great, <laughs> but true spirituality is being authentic. It's the rawness, it's the realness of it. And um, I think true healing comes about when people share the rawness and realness and authenticity of their journey mm -hmm. and their experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, uh, I'm drawn to people who uh, talk uh, honestly about uh, their life. You know, I was a drunk and, and I, you know, wrecked a car and I got into AA and that really, you know, whatever story it is yeah. that they want to tell. Um, uh, one of the things I loved about AA was the honesty that people brought to the circle. Uh, and it's an honesty you don't often find on the street because we, how are you? Oh, I'm fine, thank you, and you, good, thanks, see you, bye. And <laughs> you're gonna get a different response sometimes from people who take your question as being legitimate and say, well, you know, I'm not doing great today. You know, I had a tough yeah. time last night and da, da, da. Uh, I love that and I'm attracted to it. And I think that uh, going back, Haley, to what you were saying earlier in terms of, you know, the, the difference between people who are teaching um, this spirituality without experience, that uh, we become credible because of the lives we live, not so much by what we're saying, that yeah. people see in us something that they want. And that's what prompts them to say, can we have coffee? Uh, yeah. Because, right, you know, I, you know, I read your Facebook posts, I really like what you have to say, you know, when I'm in town, can we meet for coffee? And what they're hoping is, is that in that period of time, that somehow they're going to be able to give, uh, you're going to be able to give them, uh, you know, the menu for, you know, how to get to this point when, and you can basically, which is to, you know, uh, let go, uh, uh, let the spirit work through you, take each day at a time, live in the moment, right? All the sort of things and don't be afraid of challenges. Those are the things that make you grow. Yes, definitely. To that point, and I do want to kind of segue a little bit into your work as a very raw healer. When, you know, earlier in the, the conversation, you were talking about having to instill boundaries to sort of stop yourself sort of jumping into other people's experiences. What are some of the tools that you use and have obviously found work for you when you're working and, you know, as an ER nurse, as a holistic nurse? One thing I really had to sit with and really absorbed into my spirit and my heart was I'm not responsible for other people's healing. Mm -hmm. I'm not responsible for how people respond to me or how they absorb the information I give or absorb any information. I'm not responsible for how people react or act. I am only responsible for me, my message and how I deliver it. That's the only responsibility I have. And also my reaction to things that I'm responsible for that. And so yeah. knowing that, I think it goes back to the four agreements, right? Not taking thing, things personally, uh, being true to my word, um, being doing the best that I can. I, I try to really embody that in my life. And the boundaries that I set is I believe in the law of karma. I really do believe that the good that we give out, it comes back as good. And I also believe that when people are on their journey, they have to experience what they need to experience. I can't do the work for them because in effect, it may kind of steal the little gems and gifts that they may receive along their journey that is part of their karmic journey and their dharma, you know, and I... I don't want to take that from them. I honestly am grateful for every traumatic, painful, difficult experience that I've had in my life because it's allowed me to be the woman that I am today. And mm -hmm. it's allowed me to empathize with people that come into my path. I really do believe that I've experienced the things that I've experienced for a reason. And I've noticed that the patients that I see, the clients that I attract, they can, uh, there's like a piece of their story that I'm like, I totally 
hear what you're saying. And it's because of my journey, you know, mm -hmm. and um, it's been a blessing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But with yeah. that concept of karma and, you know, working in an ER, I can only imagine sort of the level of what I would consider broken humans coming in, whether it's mm -hmm. like their physical bodies are broken in some way. Yeah. How do you consider karma when you're looking at these people and you're seeing them so physically broken by the actions of another human? I think that the important thing is that I can't see the biggest picture, the bigger picture. I can see one part, but I know that universal love and universal peace can see the bigger picture. And although I don't understand why people experience the things that they experience, what I can do is I can hold space for them. And I think healing presence can be healing. That my presence and what I say, how I hold space for them can be a healing experience for them. And I can also offer them that hope that I don't understand why people experience the things that they do. But what I can say is that I can support them as they go through this. And oftentimes what ends up happening is they'll come back to me and be like, you know what, what I experienced in the ER was so crazy, but I really appreciate that you were there for me. So I think within that, it's like this Plutonian energy, and I'm sure each of us have it. I'm sure that people watching this video may also understand this, where Pluto, the, the energy around Pluto is about death and rebirth. And a lot of times facilitators are of healing, they actually shine in situations like this. I do well under pressure in the face of death, birth, uh, transformation and change. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know why, but it's always around me. When I used to go on dates, people would pass out. I'd have to respond to it. When I would go out partying, uh, this other person passed out. I responded to it. On a uh, flight from Hawaii to New York City, and a person had a, a cardiac event. I had to respond to it. From the plane from to uh, New York City to Tunisia, Af Africa, I had to respond to another medical emer emergency. But the thing about it is I really do believe that there are people in this world, like people listening and you and I today, where life does call us to step up to these situations. And it's not that the ego is responding, it's that we are called to hold space during challenging times to be the light um, because we have experienced traumatic events and situations in our own lives and we're able to facilitate this light and this uh, healing. I, that gave me chills. I think the way that you put it was so eloquent. And, um, you know, it is, it's also my truth that resonates with me as a truth. And I know, Brian, you and I both could talk about death all day. And, like, this concept of death and rebirth is just like a never-ending conversation. So I wanted to see how you felt about what Sarah just said. About holding space and, and responding to... Yeah, like being called to be in these places where you shine in what people consider traumatic events. Well, that, uh, it, it happens because I ask for it. Uh, you know, my, my, you and I have talked earlier about the prayer of St. Francis, you know, make me a channel of your peace. And, uh, one of the things I was thinking as you were talking earlier about the planets and, and Sarah was talking about Pluto is that um, it's, I think sometimes people can get intimidated that they'll never get, they'll never be able to make this journey because they're not into the stars and they're not into meditation or they're not into this. But all of this, all of these little things that we reference are just stories that help us understand the bigger truths. Yeah. You know, Sarah talked about growing up in a Pentecostal family. I grew up in a Roman Catholic family. And, and the stories that we learned as children um, 
were hopefully bringing us to the same conclusion, even though we were taught to discriminate against Pentecostals and anyone else who wasn't Roman Catholic. <laughs> uh, but uh, the, the, this, this, the, the story of the, the, the Greek gods, the Roman gods, the Catholic saints, the Romeo and Juliet, whatever it is, all of those contain the same truths, you know? And, and the basic bottom line truth is about love for me. Uh, uh, it's about, um, okay, what is love? Uh, what, what, what are the components of love? Do you, are you able to love others before you love yourself? No, that doesn't work very well because I run out of steam. Okay, so what does it mean to love yourself? What is it? Okay, now I know better what it means to help other people. It means sometimes not, you know, saying anything, just letting it be like Sarah was saying, hold the space. Uh, but, but so my, so the reason I think that um, things happen in my life and is that I basically send out the message, I'm here, you know, and it's, um, and it's not Brian McNaught, uh, that happens to be my name and I have a history and I have a story, but really what I'm trying to channel is much bigger than my life could ever possibly um, have discovered on its own. Um, and so, you know, Sarah, I was imagining myself in an emergency room bed um, and you coming in and me knowing immediately that I could relax. <laughs> I mean, there's something about our, our, our visage that communicates instantly to people, I believe, that, okay, you're safe with this person. This person is for you. It's not about them at this moment. Do you not find that? I mean, I, it's like you two are best, you know, buddies. What, what is it that drew you together? It wasn't personal stories as much as it was you seeing in each other, this love, you know, um, you know, Haley, that's what brought you and I together. It had nothing to do with nation of love. Nothing, of, nothing to do with our personal stories, although our personal stories brought us to this point and allowed the love to glow. You know? mm. okay. It's um, <laughs> my song of the week started, uh, what is today? I guess today's Thursday. So I guess on Tuesday afternoon, my song of the week became All You Need Is Love by the Beatles. Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. <laughs> and it's been like just consistently waking up in the morning. All you need is love. <laughs> yeah. You know, again, you know, somebody else found a way to say it. Yeah. That, that, re re that reached masses that we might not ever be able to reach. Um, but the message has to get reinforced over and over and over, just like it did for us, right? We, we, we keep having aha moments and people get aha moments from us when they, <laughs> they see a life that they want and they see a behavior that they want to emulate, right? I think that's what, that's what uh, the Desiderata was talking about too, is don't be around people who vex your spirit. Yeah. Um, it's the same message over and over. Same message. And I think part of the hero's journey is returning to the truth of love. Yes. So that and give it generously and you can resonate with unconditional love definitely give it away because it never runs out you've always got more and more of all comes <laughs> yeah because and it's not you it's not you and i think that is the sweetness of the hero's journey yes it's tough yes there are moments where you're on the ground just saying i'm exhausted how much more can there be Mm -hmm. And then you get that sweetness of love and you're like, I'm good. <laughs> Where's the next thing? <laughs> you know, so and we, 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 we talk about, you know, even the image of Jesus um, uh, uh, at, you know, allegedly God, you know, Jesus being God knew all things, knew, knew what was going to happen. You know, some people's mind asked Judas to betray him. That's, a, you know, a new thing because we have to be betrayed in order to go to the cross. But even Jesus said, you know, Father, why hast thou abandoned me? The hero's journey isn't easy. You know, we think of Jesus on the hero's journey, but he said, let this cup pass from me. I don't really want to do this. Mm -hmm. right? And it's okay. To, it's okay to have those moments in which we, no matter how much we think we've learned to say, oh my God, this is hard. This is really hard. And it's, yeah. and it's, and, yeah, and it's okay to tell other people that we've had those, it, not only, okay, we need to tell other people that we've had those moments of doubt. 
Sarah, in your journey and the sort of very raw grittiness of it, what do you think it is that keeps you on the journey, knowing how hard it is? And, you know, to Brian's point where it's just, it, there are points where you're just like, really? More? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I think honestly, I'll have to, what Brian said really reminded me when I was younger, um, I had really bad childhood asthma. And I remember having to go to the nurse's office quite a bit, um, because I couldn't breathe. And the way she hold, held space for me, I went home and I told my mom, I said, I'm going to be a nurse. Mm -hmm. And it was that holding space that drew me to being a nurse. And I I asked for this calling, you know, mm -hmm. I said, I want to be a light to people. I want to mm -hmm. um, hold space for people. I want to support people during difficult times. And it's funny, uh, Brian, that you just reminded me of that, that I kind of asked this in my life. And every day before I start my day, I, I always say, um, may I be a vessel of peace, love, mm -hmm. grace, and compassion before mm -hmm. I start my day, um, whether it's in the ER or with my private clients um, or as a holistic nurse in the New York City hospitals here. I always want to be a vessel of peace. What keeps me going, I'll be honest with you, being an ER trauma nurse for 16 years, there have been plenty of days where I'm like, why am I doing this? This is so crazy. Uh, why do I put myself through this? And I will say that I have listened to myself mm -hmm. and to add to what Brian was saying, um, where you have to listen to your spirit that says, okay, well, what energies do you want to be around? And my spirit was telling me, Sarah, I'm calling you to um, hold space and to really nurture yourself um, so that you can nurture other people. So what life was calling me to do is to dial back from being at the bedside in the ER. Um, mm -hmm. The energy there was very toxic. Uh, so my calling, honestly, in the ER when I am there, I I hold space for my coworkers. So when they're very overwhelmed, when they when they're stressed out, I listen to them. I try to offer them encouragement. I'll do Reiki with them. Uh, I'll do ear seeds. Um, so that's actually what keeps me going. What also helps me is spending daily time with myself in meditation, even if it's two minutes five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes before I start work, having that moment of groundedness and centeredness, it really allows me to realize why do I do the things that I do? It has to come from a heart of a pure intention mm -hmm. and to fill my own cup first so that I can give out of overflow and not out of depletion. And That's even when you think you're done, you know, uh, I'm se uh, Sarah. I'm 73 today, so uh, even oh, you, thank you. Even when you think, okay, you know, look at my bio. It, you know, it tells you all the stuff, all the thing I've written, da 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 da. But the voice is still there, telling you, no, I have yet. Yeah, there's more to do. There's mm -hmm. you've got more to do. And people say, well, I don't hear a voice saying there's more to do. Yeah, you do. I'm not saying that I hear a voice that says, Brian, this is God. And I'm, you know, I want you to go out and, and uh, walk past the burning bush before you do it, just so you know that I'm, it's really me. It's, it's, it's the instinct. Uh, you were saying uh, before we started, uh, Haley, about this thing about, should I rent this house? Huh? Should I leave the comfort of, you know, first of all, you left your job on Wall Street, right? So the voice was saying, this is not where you belong. So right. then you started off and you, you, you had a lot of losses by doing that. Not financial, respect, you know, your resume started to look crazy, you know. From Wall you know. Street to a spiritual counselor. <laughs> yeah, clairvoyant, she's a drag queen, you know, so, <laughs> drag queen named clairvoyant. So, uh, but even, so you, th you finally get it, right? And you get to the point where people now know your name. Now you're saying, no, I'm not, you know, now I'm thinking maybe I should um, start doing retreats. Well, you know what? After you do that for a while, the, the voice is going to still say, 
More. I've got more for you. Why haven't you written the damn book? I've been telling you, right? <laughs> and the same with you, Sarah. You said, you know, you, you, besides being an emergency room nurse, you went and started doing private practice with people, guiding them. The voice mm -hmm. inside said, okay, you've, you've made this hero's journey. You broke the pattern of your family. You know what was yeah. going on. You're a new you. But guess what? <laughs> now that the, you're the new you, I've got more use for you to do this other work. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I need you to hang that shingle. <laughs> yeah, it's so true. <laughs> it? And then I also, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, that's like the genesis of the hero's journey. Sort of when you start asking the question, who am I? you do go through those traumatic unwinding and sort of realigning and resonating with a greater truth. Once you've gone through that, I feel like I'm in this new hero's journey where it's like, do more. And I'm right. like, oh my God, how can I do this? Can I do it? Okay. You're at a, you're at a higher vibration and uh -huh. you're seeing things differently, mm -hmm. but you also are realizing that you're only halfway up the mountain. Yeah. You've got to keep climbing because you're never going to get the full view if you don't keep climbing. Yeah, you keep it's true. And I, I think the lesson too from COVID um, that has helped me is to listen to when I need to take some time to nurture myself too. I think it's really important as facilitators of healing to um, not always say yes to every project, mm -hmm. but to check in with your spirit and know what to say yes to. And it sounds like mm -hmm. you guys have definitely done that in your own personal life. Um, I will say that within this whole COVID experience, when I was working at the bedside with patients with COVID, it was something I've never experienced as a nurse. It's crazy. <laughs> I, I've never seen anything like this, to be honest. But spirit was telling me, you need to hold space for your coworkers. So on the days that I wasn't an ER nurse, I would hold sound baths and meditation and do Reiki um, for all the healthcare providers taking care of COVID patients. And that's when I just I got an energy that wasn't my own. It was something that just mm -hmm. like lifted me up on eagle's wings. And mm -hmm. I was exhausted from taking care of COVID patients, but I was inspired by um, something bigger than myself that mm -hmm. said, this is not about you. Mm -hmm. um, you will be able to rest. But right now I'm calling you to step in. And so I will say it's been such an honor to support healthcare providers as they care for patients with COVID and family members. And I actually do that as a holistic nurse now. I'm a clinical nurse liaison and um, I FaceTime with family members so that they can see their loved ones who are in isolation um, with COVID. And it, it's so humbling. It really is. It's difficult work, but it's important work. But I will say that um, this whole time has been so transformational for me. I feel I feel like I've lived like five mm -hmm. years within one year, right? I'm sure you guys feel the same and our listeners also feel the same. So um, I want to encourage everyone listening that, um, you know, take, take the time you need to nurture yourself. You're doing amazing work and continue to check in with yourself and whatever inspires you it's for a reason just like what Haley was saying that you'll get these little inspirations lean into that you know what got me out of a toxic relationship when uh, it was in 2015 I was living with someone and uh, what really helped me while I was in counseling was she asked me what is something you've always wanted to do and I was like, I've always wanted to take sewing classes. So I learned how to sew. I was surrounded by like seven year olds. And here I am, I'm, you know, in my late 30s. And I'm like sewing a, a, a little bag. But I felt so emp empowered because I listened to what inspired me. And it was from that where I chose to leave this toxic, unhealthy, abusive relationship. And um, I then 
continued that healing journey. And then I, I found out about holistic nursing programs. I enrolled into that. I started my own practice and here I am today, but it started with me listening about taking sewing classes. Yeah. <laughs> so I, Sarah, you said that uh, the, dealing or working with people with COVID is unlike anything that you've experienced. Can you tell us why? What is what is what makes it so different? Oh, oh, where do I start? Um, in the beginning, in March 2020, we didn't really know much about COVID, so it was kind of confusing. Is it airborne? Is it droplet? Like, how do we protect ourselves fully? And, you know, typically we're supposed to change our um, PPE, personal protective equipment, between every single patient. But at that time, we didn't have enough supply across the United States to be able to change after every interaction. So we were wearing the same N95 the whole day. And a lot of hospital systems are still doing that now. And so... There was a lot of fear around taking care of patients because we we want to take care of ourselves too. A lot of us are coming home to loved ones. Um, a lot of doctors and nurses were weren't able to go home to their loved ones. We were having to stay in hotels. It was really really challenging. And what was challenging as well is um, a lot of patients didn't have access to contacting their family members, family members weren't able to visit. So they were in these isolation rooms and we were having to gown up and interact with these patients briefly and provide cluster care, but not, um, we weren't able to spend as much quality time inside the patient's rooms because we were encouraged to limit our time at the bedside to reduce mm -hmm. exposure. So. It was challenging because as nurses and healthcare providers, we're, uh, our natural instinct is to do all that we can to go above and beyond. But with the, the restrictions at the time, we kind of felt limited. Um, and our own personal boundaries were saying, okay, well, you also need to limit it because you don't want to get sick. We were having uh, healthcare providers that work alongside who were passing from COVID. Um, mm and were in the ICU admitted with COVID. And seeing this was very challenging, mm -hmm. uh, not just emotionally, but professionally, um, personally with relationships. I remember talking to my boyfriend and, and being like, this is so overwhelming, it's so difficult. And you know, for people who are in healthcare, it's easy for us to share this with one another, but for people who aren't in healthcare, it's a lot to digest. So mm -hmm. a lot of people in personal relationships with family members and friends, um, we didn't feel that we could talk to them because they don't understand. Honestly, they will never understand what it's mm -hmm. like to care for people who are dying of a disease that we didn't fully understand and we're still learning about. So mm -hmm. it was challenging for us as healthcare providers. It's been challenging for people who are experiencing COVID. Um, but what I will say is I am more hopeful. I received the, the second vaccine. And uh, so I, I do feel blessed that I am able to facilitate this interaction between family members, healthcare providers, and patients at the bedside now. Thank you. A lot of gay men my age uh, will make comparisons to the early days of AIDS when even healthcare workers wouldn't go into the rooms at times, gay men would bring the meal that was left outside in the hallway into the patient because people, uh, people not only were afraid of the disease, but they made incredible judgments about the people who got the disease. Uh, and uh, so this is going back to our, our earlier conversation about our life experiences help us understand each other. You know, I can relate clearly not in the same way, uh, Sarah, uh, because I'm not, I didn't watch people uh, who I worked with uh, die as a result of their care of people with uh, HIV, but I sure remember the stigma and, yes. uh, and, and how we hosted a dinner at our house in, in Gloucester, Massachusetts. The first time anyone with AIDS was brought together socially with other people who were dying, 
And uh, people thought we were nuts, that we should fumigate our house, that we shouldn't, you know, that, that it was just irresponsible, et cetera, et cetera. So I remember the fear and the loneliness that, that comes from responding to the needs of people um, who others are afraid of. Definitely. And thank you for sharing that. You know, I, I would, I will say like on the behalf of the medical community, although I wasn't there, I do apologize for like everything that happened back then. You know, there's so much like fear and, and I think it goes back to what we were talking about before that it's about either fear or love. And I think Mm -hmm us as healthcare providers, we had to choose love, despite the fear, despite the unknowns. And I was actually working alongside an ER nurse who worked during the the HIV crisis within New York Mm -hmm. City. And she was telling me, this reminds me so much of Mm -hmm. that experience. And um, that her being able to reflect on that, it allowed her to encourage other healthcare providers, like, it's okay, we're going to get through this. Mm -hmm. We just need to be here for these patients and family members. And so I really appreciate you sharing that experience and for that reminder. Thanks. You know, I I was sorry, Haley, I'm sorry, I'm talking too much, but and I'll shut up. But I I just want to say that one of the issues was I I was, uh, I was, I, I led the Boston effort on responding to HIV because of my position in the mayor's office at the time. And I went and did a training with the nurses at Boston City Hospital. Their, their fear mostly was seeing two men holding hands. Because we're talking, remember, we're talking 1982. And so all the progress that we've made socially, you know, there was no Ellen, there was, no, there was nobody out there who was out that people could relate to except Rock Hudson and he was dying or dead. Uh, so they weren't used to seeing two men kiss or hold hand, and you had to help them get past that fear so that they could love, right, and see the people as human beings, not as some freak, you know, that they had been raised to hate or fear. Yeah, definitely, and I'm glad that you bring up these real issues. I think that's part of healing, is talking about real issues, talking about the difficult things to talk about. I think 2020 really reminded us that, like, no, like, slavery didn't happen just a long time ago. It's still happening today, and I think a lot of time people just wanted to wash over it and be like, oh, well, you know, Mm -hmm. we're doing better, or whatever, but um, these are the real issues that 2020 has really brought to our face and we're Mm -hmm. dealing with the residual energy here in 2021 and honestly I'm grateful I'm grateful for the lessons that 2020 brought us I'm Mm -hmm. grateful for the struggles it wouldn't have brought the growth that we're seeing and the the catalyst for transformation and change Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. was very much needed and uh, long overdue yep yep Haley um we are just about out of time but I have so many questions um (laughs) on sort of how you as a spiritual person, what, you know, anybody would consider a spiritual person who is sort of bridging both worlds here, both the Western medicine as well as the alternative medicine. How are you comfortable with wearing a mask and taking the vaccine? Uh, I, you know, initially I was a little hesitant because I was like, oh, it hasn't been studied for years. I, I typically want to see the research after years, but you know, I did wait. I did wait until um, some coworkers had it and they had a positive experience and uh, no untoward reactions that was, you know, leaning me more towards not getting the vaccine. So. Um, you know, the first vaccine I received the Moderna, I was fine. The second vaccine, woo, it laid me out. Uh, for two days, I had chills, uh, cool sweats. I didn't have a fever, but I felt uh, a headache on, on my temples. I felt fatigued. I felt like a semi truck hit me, like I had the mm. flu. Um, that lasted for about 36 hours. Uh, honestly, it just resolved this morning. So, yeah. um, but I will say that it that is also a sign of healing because yeah. your immune system is telling you, "Oh, this is a foreign substance, and I'm going to flood your system with all of this pushback." But so then that your immune system can build up antibodies to the foreign substance. So. Um, and it goes back to what we were talking about before that wellness and healing 
oftentimes is not easy breezy and um, painless. Sometimes you'll have these aches and discomforts, but in the long run, I'm grateful for it. Uh, hopefully, uh, I will be protected from COVID for the rest of the year and continue to provide this healing with other people and also with students because I am going back to school for acupuncture and traditional Chinese mm. medicine. So mm. I, I'm uh, learning different modalities from different cultures and I'll keep you updated. <laughs> Good. Good. Thank you. Sarah, you're great. I'm really oh, glad thank to you. Meet you. Yeah, <laughs> I you appreciate it. Great, loving, uh, welcoming energy. And thank uh, you so much. It's, it's good to be in your presence. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. And if anybody has any questions about what I do or they want to reach out to me, you can check out my website at www.sarangheeling, S A R A N G, healing, H E A L I N G.com. And sarang means to hold space in Korean, it means love in Korean, it also means light um, in different languages. So that's my practice, and I am honored to be with you. Thank you so much. Sarah, spell it again so that people. S A R A N G H E A L I N G. And it's the same on Instagram and Facebook, uh, Sarang Healing. Good. I'll include all of those links in um, the video, so they'll be there too. But, um, oh, great. Great. And the email is wellness at sadanghealing.com. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time and You're for welcome. doing it such an inspiration. And Thank I do follow, I mean, you and I don't talk that often, but I do follow you a lot on um, Instagram. And one of the most profound photos of 2020 for me, when I look at, so you know how time puts out those photos of 2020 was the photo that you posted of you in a tent, everybody in their scrubs having a sound bath. And I was just like, this is where we're going people it's just filled me with so much hope mm. and i have this little cheerleading thing where i'm like go humans yeah, <laughs> one of those yeah. Where we're like guys we're gonna be okay yeah. yeah thank you so much you know i i still do that uh at one of the hospitals here in new york city i hold space for staff uh that are still fighting the front lines of covid um, and I lead weekly sound baths and I do Reiki and coaching for healthcare providers and, um, you know, continue to keep them in your prayers and in your thoughts. A lot of people, because there isn't uh, as much media about this fight on the front lines, they've kind of forgotten about the healthcare providers. But mm -hmm. if you think about it, we've been doing this since March. It's tiring. A lot of healthcare providers have PTSD and burnout. So keep us in your prayers and your thoughts. And um, if you'd like to make donations of food donations or write like cards for anyone listening, it's much appreciated. The cards, the encouragement, um, because it's not easy to gown up in PPE every day. Um, it's hot, it's sweaty. It's, it's very, very difficult. So I, I will yeah. say so that we, we do encourage it. Yeah, I'll get in touch with you afterwards and make sure that we add sort of those avenues of support into the comments for this video. And then I'd be happy to, to maybe even do like a social media mini campaign, just sort of highlighting that, you know, this is still something that healthcare workers are on the front lines of. It is still really tough. I'm still surprised and shocked mm -hmm. that there's still a shortage of the PPEs, you know, a year later. Yeah, it's not necessarily shortage. It's the um, the idea of keeping one in ninety five mask on the whole day that's challenging. But it's like the new normal. I think a lot of people yeah. are having to get used to this new normal. Um, yeah. yeah. So you know, as we wrap up, we get used to it because of love. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah, and it, and it helps us build up this resiliency to uh, find the love and the joy and the humor and, and laughter within the daily, the daily things we go through. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I'm in love with all of you. Happy, happy birthday, Brian. I Thank you. All of us have a wonderful full moon and I'm, I can't wait to see how big and how much we embrace our full potential over the next year yes definitely thank you i'm excited oh, love. Bye. bye thank bye. you bye, -bye.